Welcome everybody, Terry Maxwell here, and I'm talking about becoming a virtualpreneur. And what that means to me is capitalizing on the freelance marketplace. Now, anybody that knows me knows that I choose words very carefully. And the freelance marketplace, it is truly a marketplace. A marketplace is a, a, is a can be an invisible or a visible place. If you've ever been to a marketplace, like in the Caribbean, they're fascinating. Um, what a marketplace is, is really supply and demand. It's an exchange of goods and services. And that's really what we have right now um, in a whole new way. Um, so I kind of pride myself on the fact that a very difficult life really taught me perspective. So that's where I grew up. That's a little, and I guess I was probably four years old there. Um, this was our backyard with my brothers and um, this was me working and I've worked hard my entire life and it almost has been a blessing and a curse because sometimes I think things have to be harder than they are. But this idea of um, hard work led me to becoming an entrepreneur. And I want to put that into perspective because that's what really allowed me to see this incredible trend that I now call the virtualpreneur marketplace. So I started my career, believe it or not, as a, a middle school English teacher. Um, I was going to save the world, save kids. Um, and that led me, after about three years, I left the classroom, not because I didn't enjoy it because I love teaching probably more than anything. I love teaching. Um, but I left because the educational system doesn't really allow you to teach. Um, and I couldn't teach the love of learning and I couldn't teach helping kids inspire their potential because I was kind of forced into this little box. But this really cool thing happened is I got hired by an educational software company and that's where I learned I had this natural gift for business I didn't know I had grew that career, eventually became president of an internet company, which we took that company public um, on the NASDAQ stock exchange. Um, then the dot-com bubble burst, the dot-com bubble burst, and I was burst right on top of the bubble and uh, started all over. But I had been bitten at this point by the startup bar bug, and I was never going back. So I started my first startup in January of 2002, 20 years ago, a little more than 20 years ago and um, became an entrepreneur. And then today um, I do everything on purpose and my purpose is to inspire your potential. So this idea of virtualpreneur, so, so imagine we, we, we know what happened in 2008 and 2009, big, big, big crash. And um, I sell my business, start over with this brilliant idea that I'm going to make money and do good. And it was like, I had this epiphany because I was really wrestling with how do I actually make money, but also do good. And I stumbled across this idea about purposeful business and purposeful investing. And so I became an investor in purpose, quite honestly. I, I, I cashed out a lot of my retirement. I mean, I bet the farm on purpose, right? That you could do something that you were born to do and the born to do part is really going to be important to you as we go through this with this question about how can I do good and make money so that was really the dilemma for me is when I first started my career as a teacher I was doing meaningful work and then I went to work for an educational software company teaching teachers how to teach students with computers Wow, that was meaningful. And then I started having financially, financial success. Now, if you grow up as poor as I did, money was like a drug for me for a large part of my life is I was constantly chasing money to feel good enough. So for me, there was an or between meaningful work and financial success. Today, I can tell you emphatically, it's an and. And I believe that's what the virtual preneur marketplace gives people is the ability to do work that they find meaningful and create money doing it. 
So what's fueling this new world? Um, a lot of the pundits said, oh, it's COVID, it's COVID. Um, but the reason why this um, book publisher wanted us to re-release the new world of work is because we don't believe it's because of COVID. We believe COVID simply awakened people to the possibilities that were already there. They just couldn't see them. But it also helped businesses see the power of virtual and freelance staff. And that's the opportunity for you if you can think differently about this marketplace. So COVID just awakened workers to there is another way. And most of those workers couldn't see this other way because they were heads down doing their job. They couldn't see it. And most of the businesses couldn't see that this is actually a better workforce model. Um, and that's the exciting part. So as I mentioned, um, literally 10 years ago, we released the new world of work from the cube to the cloud. The second edition is going to be coming out this summer. And we had three big ideas in the new world of work. First is work is now fractionalized. So what that means is a job, let's say a marketing manager job is this pen. And fractionalization means that I'm going to break this. Of course, I can't separate this one. Let me do this one, this pen. This is a marketing manager job. And we're going to separate this into little individual parts. And we're going to take that job apart into, and turn it into four different jobs. That's what fractionalization is. We saw this 10 years ago. We saw that it was already happening and we were like, wait a minute. So you don't hire a marketing manager anymore. You hire a social media manager, you hire a digital advertiser, you hire an analytics person, you hire three people that each do a part of a job rather than hiring one person. So this was again, 10 years ago, right? Second big idea we had is that technology is now virtualized, obviously. Um, a lot of people were able to pivot from COVID and go online. Um, we're doing it right now. But, but again, 10 years ago, you could do the same thing. It's not like the technology dramatically changed. Mobile made it a little bit easier because now I can run courses off my phone and do all sorts of things. But technology allowed us to be virtual, to work from anywhere. But the third thing and this is where the opportunity is giant, is talent will forever be globalized. There's no boundaries to work anymore. I have clients in Europe. I have clients in South America. I have clients in Australia. And although we have to work around the time zone, it, you know, we still can work together. So from that vantage point, there are no boundaries to work. So I'm going to break each of these trends down for you and show you how to capitalize on them. First is the fractionalization of work. You, you want to stop thinking about a job and start thinking about tasks. So even a graphic designer can now be broken down into just somebody that does logos. Literally, there's a platform called Logo Tournament. And the designers on Logo Tournament, all they do is logos. The Succeed on Purpose logo was created on Logo Tournament. Um, content writer. 10 years ago, you hired a content writer. Today, I might hire a blog writer, or I might hire a short form writer, a long form writer, or a copywriter. Very, very different. Administrative assistant. A couple of you mentioned that you were administrative assistant. Today, you could specialize. You could niche down. And let's say you like emails and schedules, and you could just do that. Um, consultant, maybe you become a CRM expert. If you're a programmer, maybe you, you decide to specialize on just mobile apps. So the idea that fractionalization has made it so that the work that you do is just this little tip right here. So I'm just going to specialize in this tip. This is what I love to do. Now that's where the problem comes in is figuring out what you love to do and that niching down process. Let me put into perspective how big this opportunity is. By 2025, 70% of the workforce will be working remotely. We had predicted 10 years ago that by 2018, it would be 50% of the workforce. And we were pretty close. It was about 44 before COVID. 
Um, but 70% of the workforce will be working remotely. That means like forever, the, they're not going back to the cube. Um, and according to the US uh, Bureau of Labor stats, there are now 53 million people freelancing. That exceeded our expectation. Um, it represents 1.5 million in transactions. It's huge, huge marketplace. So the marketplace concept, though, is what I want you to really understand. So this is a picture in Prague, one of my favorite places to visit, of a marketplace. And it was one of my most enjoyable experiences of actually what you would, you would bring your wares to the marketplace and you could either pay for products or you could trade for products. So fascinating, right? Um, food marketplace. I love to go to our um, Whole Foods marketplace that happens one Saturday a month. So how does a marketplace work? Really simple, it works off of supply and demand. Um, and right now the demand is high, but it won't always be that way. As more and more people figure out and start virtualpreneur businesses, it's going to level off. And that's what you really want to be prepared for. And the more you are doing the work that you are passionate about, the better you will be at um, uh, achieving success in this marketplace. So this idea of a marketplace is now so big that there are platforms that will, will bring you work. So, and I wanna talk about some of them in particular that are partners of ours, because some of you should be working on these platforms. So the way these platforms work is they bring clients and they match them with you. It's kind of like match.com, but for virtualpreneurs. Um, this, these platforms are so many of them now, I had to actually break them into this grid. So skill and experience, personalized selection and matching, just look how many there are. I'm gonna point out a couple. Um, let's see, uh, Cheryl, you should definitely check out Listeners on Call. Anybody that really enjoys <coughs> um, heart-centered work, these are people that are in some stage of grief. They're going through some type of transition and it's an app and I have it on here. Um, we have it because I have elderly in-laws that have some challenges. And when I can tell a family member is down, I, I basically send her a message and say, hey, jump on listeners on call. There's a couple of people on there that you can chat with and you just talk about your problems to them. And they give you, they listen, they give you some encouragement. They're not therapists, although they have another level with some therapists in there, but that's a great solution for somebody that's doing grief work or helping people um, that are in a compromised state in some capacity. So highly, highly recommend listeners on call. Results Resourcing is a partner of both Succeed and Shifco. Highly recommend them. Um, what you do on Results Resourcing is you fill out your profile and they match you with jobs, you have to check your profile and you have to check your matches at least once a week. Um, but they're always looking for great talent. So that's another example. On the strategy side, Top Tall is good, Expertira. Wise Her is another one that I recommend. Um, I've been following the CEO and founder of that for a while. Um, and everything on that is, uh, it's, it's women entrepreneurs that she matches people with, with a variety of skill sets. So again, there's many others, um, just answer chief of stuff, expert engine experts on demand. Um, you can see, and there are more, these are just the ones that I've personally had some experience with that I recommend. So, you know, what you can do is, and, and these are the kinds of signs that when I see something like this happening, it really gets my attention because you wouldn't have this many. And again, this is maybe 10% of all the platforms that are out there. You wouldn't have this many platforms matching you with work if it wasn't a huge opportunity. The large of uh, largest one of these, of course, is Upwork. Um, I, I don't like Upwork as, as well as I do some of the other ones, um, unless it's a very, very tactical project that I just need, you know, somebody to do this one little thing, I'm in, I'm out. 
um, I prefer some of the other ones. So check out any of those. You can take a screenshot of that. Um, again, there are others, but these are the ones that I've had personal experience with. So that's an example of fractionalization of work. Now, the other thing that I learned from my research is making the transition. Um, it's a new career uh, and it is a step-by-step -step process. It's a career decision. Best advice I ever got when I first became an entrepreneur in 2002, I had a coach I was working with at the time and I was struggling. Should I take this job? I, I was failing as an entrepreneur. And she said to me, well, Terry, you've made the career decision to be an entrepreneur when you've shifted your career in the past, what did you do? And it never occurred to me that being an entrepreneur was a career decision. And so it is a career decision. What, what kinds of things can you do with that? Here's the training that I've boiled it down to. And this is what we're gonna have in Virtual Entrepreneur Academy. One is you need to get clients. Um, and in that, it's like, who do, who do you actually wanna serve? Like, don't work with people you don't like working with. Where are they? Um, and what do they need? Um, so those are the first three things that you have to be able to answer. And when we create Virtualpreneur Academy, it's basically like a starter course. And then we have a partnership with a company called Virtual Experts, where people then um, take that start, go from that starter course to actually building a ten thousand a dollar a month business, something like that, as a virtualpreneur. So. I can tell you that emphatically, the first three things you've got to answer is who do you want to serve? Where are those clients and what do they actually need? Second thing is you have to keep them. And how can I serve them better than anyone else? And why should they continue to pay me? So I ask myself those questions every single day. I wake up every day and say, who am I called to serve? How can I serve them? Why should they continue to work with me? And it's for me, it's kind of like keeping the saw sharp. And then lastly is the things that we have to do to run the business. Now, I can tell you from two decades of starting and growing businesses, worry about that last thing last. Focus and excel on getting clients and keeping clients. Everything else you can figure it out as you go. Um, but the getting clients and keeping clients is where you want to start. Now, the other thing that I learned um, in the last 10 years since we wrote The New World of Work, we began the research on this when the book came out, is that everybody's not the same when it comes to building a business. So um, there's doers. Doers are motivated by tasks and operating in a familiar structure. They do great on virtual entrepreneur platforms. It's perfectly a match for them. Then you've got solvers. Solvers are motivated by solving problems and experiencing freedom. Solvers also do well on virtual entrepreneur platforms. The third type of entrepreneur is a builder, and a builder is motivated by building things and creating value. Builders do not do well on a virtual entrepreneur platform. So if you're a builder, those platforms that I mentioned previously are not going to be a good fit for you. So let's break down each of these um, so that you can assess. And as you identify which of these personas is yours. I want you to put it in the chat so that I can see that. Um, so the idea of a solver um, is first of all, a solver, I'm gonna start with a solver. 58% um, of the people that we surveyed were solvers. And solvers generally make great virtual entrepreneurs, whether they're on one of those platforms or not. What a solver is motivated by is identifying and solving the problems. A solver doesn't want to be managed. A solver doesn't want to be told what to do. A solver doesn't want to be told how to do it. So the largest group of entrepreneurs are solvers. Um, builders, I'm a builder. And um, although I build things that solve problems and I like solving problems, my real passion is building it. Once it's built, I'm completely bored. And that's why I have a portfolio of companies today. That's why I've lost a lot of money building businesses is because that's the fun part. I've even built things, torn them down and rebuilt them. So our research found about 22% of entrepreneurs are builders. So 
that means that the majority by far are solvers. And if you identify as being a solver, you can have a great business as a virtualpreneur. Doers actually prefer very familiar structures. They actually work better in corporate America. However, if you're on a good platform, something like results resourcing, um, and they match you with clients, that's a good option as well. So I'd love to take a minute, answer any questions you have about these personas, and I would love to have you um, put in the chat which one you think is yours. Any questions about them or putting in the chat which one you think is yours? Okay, so now that we've taken a look at that, let's let's talk about how to prepare for this virtualpreneur world. Number one, know why you want more meaning and success. Why do you want to do this? Building a business, I don't care whether it's a virtualpreneur business or a traditional business, it's hard, but you are free. So why do you want more meaning and success? I'd love for you to put that in the chat as well. Why do you want more meaning and success? Is it because of freedom? Is it because you're kind of sick of the corporate way? But why do you want more meaning and success? Um, I'd love to hear what you have to say in the chat on why you want more meaning and success. My second piece of advice is choose growth over comfort. I'll never forget this graphic that you see on the right, this quote, growth and comfort cannot coexist. It was one of the things my coach told me 20 years ago when I was, I'd started my first business and was failing miserably. It took me two years before I even remotely made enough money to pay my bills. Two years, it was horrible. But I remember her saying, Terry, growth and comfort can't exist. What do you really, really want? And so these two go together, knowing why you want more meaning and success and knowing you can either grow or be comfortable, choose. Um, so let's look. Deborah says, I have the gift to deliver a wealth opportunity and build more stuff. I love that. Freedom. Excellent. So if you know your why you want more meaning and success, then you've got to be OK being uncomfortable and choosing growth over comfort. Freedom and to feel fulfilled. Yeah, I love that. To feel of service. That's what does it for me too. And then, of course, seeking experts who've done it and are always willing to help you make the transition um, and being part of an organization that does that is key. So the last thing I want to do, and then um, I've got a story I'm going to tell you, is this is how my, my mantra right now is that everything is easy. That's my mantra. Um, and when I really reflected on that coming into 2022, easy was my word for 2022. Um, the first thing uh, is I wrote down, you know, how do you actually build a successful business? The first thing is it's easy when you just let go and grow. So too often what happens to us when we're building a business of any type is we get focused on what's not working and what we don't have and and we go down into the trenches and the doldrums and the what if downing. And what I've trained my mind and my body to do, it doesn't matter whether I think it's working or not, I'm just gonna let go and grow. Like literally it's, I'm just gonna go where it takes me. And sometimes it takes me into places where it looks like it's not working and then all of a sudden it starts to work. And what I wanna encourage you to do with this first insight is just let go and grow. Just follow it where it's taking you. And if it feels like it's not working, that's just temporary. It's just taking you someplace. So that's number one. Second is, this, my second easy statement is, it's easy when I focus on becoming my best. So this is another thing I've trained my mind and my body to do. I'm not trying to be better than anyone. I'm trying to be better than I was yesterday. That's it. And so I'm just going to try every single day to be better than I was yesterday. I'm not trying to be better than anybody else. I'm not trying to beat anybody. I'm not trying to build the best company, the best this, the best that. I'm just going to be a little bit better than the person I was yesterday. So it's easy when I just focus on that. And I don't get upset about who likes me, who doesn't like me, who's 
who's on, you know, who's a fan of mine, who's not a fan of mine. I don't care. I'm just going to focus on being better than I was yesterday. Third easy statement is it's easy when I learn from others. The thing that I love to do is I love to be around people that I can learn from. Um, when you grow up the way that I did, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute, you, the only way you survive is you have to learn really quickly. And so I mastered this ability to watch people and learn. And I am an astute observer of people and the people that are in my inner two circles, I'm constantly learning from them, whether they know it or not, I'm constantly learning from them. And I'm obsessed with that. I'm like a sponge. So it's easy when you learn from others and learn from everybody, learn from your kids, learn from your clients, learn from the people, the contractors on your team, learn from books that you read, learn from shows that you watch, but just learn, just be a sponge. And then lastly, and this is my biggest lesson for 2022, it's easy when I focus on a step at a time. So this, I'm going to speak to the builders here. If you're a builder, builders have this amazing ability to see where they are and to see where they want to go. So if you're a builder, you can relate to this. The problem is we're so busy seeing where we want to go that um, we're so busy seeing where we want to go and we're so focused on that that we constantly feel like we're falling short of that vision. And I went through this as well for the large part of my purposeful journey. I had this dream of what it's going to look like when I'm quote unquote there. And if you're a builder, I know you can relate to this, but we're constantly so focused on that vision that all we can see is the gap between where we are and where we want to go. And that is not a healthy place to be. So what I've trained myself is I absolutely have the same vision. I have the exact same vision. I'm standing on my um, patio in uh, Maui where my house is, phone rings, my assistant comes out and she says, Oprah's on the phone and she wants you to uh, come on to Super Soul Sunday. Like literally, that's as real to me as sitting here with you today. But I got a long way to go before that happens, right? And, and my tendency as a builder is to focus on the distance between where I am and where I want to go. And literally over the last two years, I've just trained myself to just simply have that vision. That vision is not changing. That vision has been in my mind since 2011, more than 10 years. I've seen the exact same vision, but I'm just basically focused on being with you here right now. And that's it. And I know that somehow this step that I'm in right now is somehow leading me to that. And I don't know how or when that's going to happen, but that will take the pressure off, particularly for builders. Builders have a tendency to obsess over all the steps because the building is so much fun that they focus on how far away they are um, from their goal versus just being with the step that they're on today. So those are a few insights for the journey. And I'm just going to end with the story and then I'll turn the recording off and we can talk a little bit more about your journey. Um, this is one of my favorite stories to tell. This is my grandpa. Uh, I get very emotional when I tell the story. Um, so I was a basketball player and um, my grandpa uh, was like my hero and he wasn't at this particular game. But um, I was a point guard, so I would dribble the ball down the court and pass and shoot and all this kind of stuff. And I was a pretty good basketball player. It was a championship game. First half, man, we were smoking it. Like, I could do no wrong. I was scoring. I was passing. I think I probably had more assists than I had ever had. And I was just like a cloud nine. Now, when you grow up the way that I did, I had a huge chip on my shoulder. So when I went in at halftime, I was bragging, beating my chest, like, you know, I'm just, we're going to run the score up and, you know, I'm so wonderful and all this kind of stuff. So come out the second half, the posing coach had recognized that I dribbled the ball down the right side of the court with my right hand. And in basketball, there's something called a trap. And what a trap is, is two defenders come up to the half court line 
right as you pass the half court line and they trap you in the corner of either the right side or the left side. So they set a trap right across. I go right across the half court line. You can't step back on the half court line. I come across, they set the trap. I lose the ball, they score. So that's not the funny part. Funny part is I get the ball back and I was mad and I drove like a bat out of, you know, what down the court, right side, same right, right side to the exact same spot. And this time they start approaching me and I'm like, I'm going to show you. And I tried to run right between them. Basketball is not a context sport. (laughs) So they, I got called an offensive foul. They lose the ball. They score again six times. I went to the exact same spot six times. I went to the exact same spot and every single time they either stole the ball or I stepped out of bounds or whatever. So the coach pulls me out, a silly man. And, uh, and I'm furious. I'm throwing my water bottle, my towel. I mean, I'm just furious. We lose the game. I storm out of the gym. It's all the coach's fault. I go over to my grandpa's house and I'm huffing and puffing. And my grandpa, you can see his little goatee there and he starts rubbing his goatee. And I always knew that that meant trouble. And he says, yeah, Terry, you get what you focus on. And, you know, I was 14 at the time. So I put my hands on my hips, like any good 14 year old said, grandpa, it's not my fault. What are you talking about? And he said, let me ask you a question. The first half, when you were winning, what were you focused on? Scoring. And the second half, what were you focused on? And I thought about it and had this sinking feeling. And I said, the defender. And he says, yeah, you get what you focus on. And I could kind of tell I was really like in big trouble now. And I'm like, but grandpa, and he said, Terry, think about it. The first half you were focused on your goal. The second half you took your eye off of the goal and you put it on the obstacle. You get what you focus on. And literally, I've got the same little goosebumps that I had back then. That's what we do, guys. We take our eye off of what we want and we put it on the thing that's not working and the challenges and the doubters and all this kind of stuff. And all that does is make us feel depressed and down and discouraged. Man, he was right. He was right. He also told me, He said, Terry, I was a young man in the Great Depression in Racine, Wisconsin. Everywhere I looked, the farms were going under, everywhere. But I noticed that there were certain places in town, in Racine, Wisconsin, where people were actually having prosperity and abundance. And I became curious as a young man, what did they have that the folks over here didn't have? Was it education? Were they married? Did they come from rich families? Was it this side of the tracks or that side of the tracks? He said it was none of that. The people that were successful had an uncanny ability to focus on the opportunities the Great Depression afforded them. He said there were opportunities. There were millionaires and billionaires that were created out of the Great Depression because they chose to focus on the opportunities rather than the obstacles. And he said, you know, you're going to have a difficult life. You're only 14 and, you know, your parents are alcoholics and they beat you and it's challenging. And, uh, you know, and he knew this was happening, but he was like, there's nothing I can do. You know, back then they didn't have child protective services. And he's like, you've got to focus on the life that you want to create. So I followed his advice. And I am encouraging you to do the same. Building a business of any type is the most challenging thing you'll do. Maybe second only to having kids. Shoot, I can't even raise my dog. So I don't know what it's like to raise kids. But focus on what you want. And don't focus on what's not working. Don't focus on the doubters. Don't focus on the lost client. Don't focus on the person who said no. Don't focus on the prospect that ghosted you. Don't focus on your bank balance. Don't focus on your revenue. Don't focus on your profit. Focus on what you want. Everything else is a distraction. So what I trained myself to do is to have a crystal clear vision of what my life is going to look like. That vision that I told you in Maui, the Maui house, when Oprah calls, hold it. That's what I focus on. 
every single day I see that picture and then I focus on who can I serve today? What client needs help from me today? And then the morning I get up again, I clear my energy, I focus on that vision. I come back to who can I serve today? What step can I take today? I don't focus anymore on the gap between where I am and what I want. I don't focus anymore on the obstacles. I don't focus anymore on the failure. I don't focus on my doubts. Every time I feel those doubts and those not good enough things coming into my head, breathe that out of my body, put my focus back on who can I serve? What step can I take today in order to create that vision? So I want to challenge you as an entrepreneur. You get what you focus on. What are you focused on? Are you focused on what's working? Are you focused on what's not? Are you focused on where you're winning? Are you focused on where you feel like you failed? Wherever that is, wherever your focus is, is what you're creating. So I want to thank you for listening to this. I'm going to hit the um, stop recording button so that we can load this up to our YouTube page and answer any questions that you have. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in.